Hey folks, I'm about to fill you in. Oh, this is Ben Greenfield, by the way. I should probably say that for those of you who have never heard the show before. I'm going to fill you in today on cell phones and why you got to be really careful with them. So this one's going to freak you out and turn you into a complete aluminum hat, aluminum tinfoil hat wearing uh, hippie in the forest. But either way, it's important information that you got to know. Uh, here's something else important. Stuffed squash and spicy red curry with collard greens and basmati rice. That's right. This vibrant dish is a Thai spin on a traditional cool weather favorite, stuffed squash. And you can get all of the ingredients to make this yourself sent straight to you along with a handy ingredient card that shows you exactly how to make this impressive meal when you hook up with this company called Blue Apron. And what Blue Apron does is they partner with over 150 different local farms and fisheries and ranchers across the United States. And they get humanely raised beef and free range chicken and naturally raised pork. And they hook up with farms that have regenerative farming practices and then they deliver meals and ingredients to you. So you get all these recipes, you get a box with all the ingredients, you can prepare them literally. Some of these meals take 10, 20 minutes to make and it's less than 10 bucks a meal to get these extremely high quality ingredients sent to your house along with ways that you can make them taste amazing. Even my kids use this stuff when we get our blue apron meals. They whip out the recipe cards and they can make me a full on meal like this stuffed squash and spicy red curry within a matter of minutes. So you can check them out over at blueapron.com slash Ben. And when you do, you get your first three meals free with free shipping. All you do is you go to blueapron.com slash Ben and you get your first three three meals free with free shipping. Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by a website that's actually a ton of fun to surf around on because they have these really, really cool minimalist styled watches. They actually have sunglasses too, but they're called movement watches. I have one and it's amazing. It's got like a leather strap on it and a white face. As a matter of fact, if you go to their website right now it, and their website, I'll, I'll give you in a second, uh, the exact watch that I'm wearing is being shown on the model the attractive hand model of the man on that website. So I must have chosen a good one. And uh, if you don't want to go stand in line to buy a watch at the mall and you want to get a slamming deal on a watch that would normally cost $400 to $500, but you get for under 100 bucks because this company cuts out the middleman, you just go to MV mtwatches.com slash Ben. Not only that, you get free shipping, you get free returns, and you get an additional 15% off their already really, really rock bottom prices on amazing watches. So mvmtwatches.com slash Ben if you want to step up your watch game like I stepped up mine. In this episode of the Ben Group from Fitness Show... Power supplies and everything else that became part of the technology that evolved there, and they were all emitting emissions that that were dangerous to the users. So we just didn't have a sense at that time that that was something we needed to focus on. Here's the first findings that come out that are statistically significant that identify with a confidence level that what we found is is likely there. That's what's important about that. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there when you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast.
Hey folks, it's Ben Greenfield, and I don't know about you, but literally like two feet away from me right now, and now it's in my hand because I looked at it because I, I just can't resist when I when I look at it or feel it or touch it or have it in my pocket to play with it. Uh, you probably have a cell phone nearby, possibly a, a fancy smartphone like I have. I resisted getting one for a long time. I was probably one of the last people that I know who actually got a cell phone and, and I sprung for like the cheapo flip phone, but I've gotten to the point now where I, well, what I have is a, is an iPhone 6S. I may eventually spring for the seven. And frankly, if you're listening in, you are probably, unless you're a freak of nature living with hairy armpits out in the middle of the Ozark somewhere, uh, you probably have a smartphone. So um, the the thing I want to address today on today's podcast is how we can actually keep these things from damaging our bodies and in terms of radiation. And I want to delve into the type of radiation they produce, but also ways that we can shield ourselves, not only from things like the phones that we have in our pockets, but also, and this is another really annoying thing uh, for me when I, when I like walk through an airport or I'm at a conference. Uh, the laptops that we, in many cases, uh, place over our ovaries slash gonads right there in our laps. And that, that's another big issue that I know, in addition to having a cell phone in your pocket, that, uh, that can cause some pretty serious uh, health implications. So uh, my guest today is, uh, he's, he's a really well-recognized and uh, an influential expert in the realm of shielding uh, electronic emissions and electromagnetic radiation uh, from things like laptops and cell phones. His, his name is Daniel DeBon, and Daniel used to work uh, with companies like AT&T and Bell Labs and Telcordia. Uh, and has over 30 years of electrical engineering experience in the telecommunications industry. And uh, then uh, after that, he went on and oversaw laboratories that analyzed things like uh, electromagnetic radiation interference from phones and electrical signals and digital formats, and uh, was really recognized as, a, as an industry authority when it comes to uh, analyzing how we can protect ourselves from smartphones and the type of things that they produce. So he also um, invents EMF radiation protection technology, which we'll also talk about ways that you can actually shield yourself uh, from the type of radiation that, that your mobile device produces. So uh, this should be an interesting one, again, if you own or use a laptop or a smartphone. Daniel, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. I really appreciate you inviting me. So I guess the first question I have for you is, is your phone in your pocket right now? No way. No, <laughs> no way. Okay. No, well, no I, way. that that might be a good place to start because, um, frankly, in, in many cases, when you tell somebody mm -hmm. that a phone might b cause issues or might not be something you want to have constantly against your body, you get a raised eyebrow because, uh, frankly, with societal pressure and peer pressure and social norms, just about everybody has, has their phone in their pocket or in their hand. So what exactly is the, the type of radiation that something like this emits? Um, let me give you an example. Uh, should you have a microwave oven? And you go into the microwave and you put your piece of meat in the microwave. The, the water between the cells actually oscillate the cells and cooks the meat. Right. So that is a 2.4 gigahertz signal. That's a strong, powerful, um, has powerful strength. That is just about the identical frequency that's in your cell phone. So just like the fact that it could cook your meat, it also has the capacity with less energy, of course, uh, to heat up your cells. But it's way Which, less energy. I mean, you're, you're not arguing oh, that, that, yeah. a, that a smartphone could, like, cook food. Oh, yeah, there, there's no doubt. It, it's far less energy. But what's interesting is that just because it's lower energy doesn't mean it has um, no danger. Uh, some uh, it's certainly less danger, but it's certainly not no danger. Um, in, in fact, there's a lot of evidence that talks about um, the RF signal of uh, being uh, a source of a low level radiation that does cause problems 
to the cells it hits of a human body. Okay. And I, I want to back it up a second because you use that, that term RF radiation. And the way that I understand it is that there's different types of radiation that these devices admit, like like you refer to that RF radiation, which I think is the the cellular radiation. But what what are the different types of radiation that these devices actually produce? Oh, that's a good a good question, man. A cell phone transmits a Bluetooth signal, a Wi-Fi signal, and a cellular connection signal. All three of them are RF radio frequency. Okay. RF is equivalent to a microwave, as I just pointed out for my example. They're all in the same family. They're around um, 900 megahertz to 8 gigahertz coming out of your cell phone and three sources. But what's interesting about your question is there's another emission that you worry about as well, and that's extremely flow, uh, slow, uh, uh, low frequency, and that's anything under 300 hertz. Very low stuff. Extremely um, low frequency. Yes, extremely low frequency. Is that the is that the same thing as ELF? It is ELF. Okay. Yeah, it's it is ELF, and and um, ELF um, is the term that we everywhere refers to, and that's for three hundred hertz and below. When you have a, a device, any device that takes power, AC or DC, and absorbs that power and converts it to talking on a phone, toasting your toast, vacuuming your floor, a byproduct of those electrons running through the system actually emit extremely low frequency emissions. Um, and sometimes those emissions can be very low. Uh, cell phones can generate 10, it's called milligauss, is a reference to how you measure it. Um, and a, a toaster can, can generate a 150 milligauss. Okay, got uh, it. So, so, so the e, so so this the cell radiation, the RF radiation, is obviously so you could make and receive calls. The Wi Fi right. is so you could whatever surf the internet or have, or have a Wi Fi connection. The Bluetooth right. is obviously to do things like you know whatever talk to a Fitbit or or interact with anything else yeah. that your phone might be interacting with. Then this right. ELF radiation, that's just basically what the phone needs to to be powered on. You, well, when you're taking the power, when you're converting it, a, a byproduct is the uh, unwanted byproduct is emissions that are coming from the from the device itself. When you use a hairdryer, there, there's a coil there and a 60 cycle uh, emissions coming out of that at probably 150 milligauss. So there's a, a an emission coming out of that. Anything that takes power and converts it is likely to uh, create an emission. Uh, at the low end. Okay. All right. So we've got these four different types of radiation, your, your RF right. radiation, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and extremely low frequency. Now, in, in terms of evidence of harm from any of these, I think that, you know, and we've talked about this on the podcast before, you know, we've the Wi-Fi signal produced by, for example, the Wi-Fi router in your house. There's plenty yes. of evidence that, that that can cause some issues, you know, uh, cognitive issues, cell issues, neural issues, et cetera. Right. But, you know, the, these other forms of radiation, you know, is there really evidence that they're, that they're harmful? And if, if so, where can we find this evidence and how strong is it when it comes to what it, what it can cause? I mean, are we just talking about like a reduction in sperm quality? Are we talking about like bodies in the streets with brain cancer? Um, what, what can we actually say in terms of the harmful potential of something like these? That's a very broad question. Um, let, let me try to uh, break it down for you. Uh, I'll give you an example first before I start, so, so it frameworks what I'm about to talk about. In uh, cigarette smoking, when I was young, uh, 12 years old, which was quite a number of years ago, nothing was known publicly about the linkage between cancer, lung cancer, and smoking. It was only in the 80s that we actually began getting evidence that was public domain evidence that suggested there was um, some dangers to the body uh, as when you smoked. So it was around for many, many years. Science knew for a long, long time it created problems, but it never became common knowledge until they began losing in courts. So there's an example of technology that was being used in our environment for 20, 30 years before we really knew 
publicly that, in fact, there was some potential concerns to our health. Now, fast forward to electronics today. When I grew up, I didn't have a cell phone. Maybe maybe you did, um, but I didn't. No, nah, I had a pager, which was right, kind of weird. Yeah. But, but right, when, exactly. it was kind of funny. I was one of the few kids that had a pager because, and I wasn't a drug dealer. Um, my dad had a communications company uh, in which he, uh, well, he had, he had an ambulance service and then a communications company where they did things like scanners and pagers and et cetera. So me and all my brothers grew up with a pager, which actually really annoyed us because our mom could like page us at any time and just be like, hey, what's up? Where are you? Um, so we, we weren't huge fans of the pagers. But yeah, I didn't grow up with a cell phone, but I did grow up with a pager. Yeah. In fact, uh, I had none in my life. You had some technology. Uh, today, your kids, the young young generation, they have a, a cell phone by the six years old using the cell phone. So all of a sudden, it's becoming to permeate our lives, the use of these uh, modern portable devices. And how much do we know about it? Well, we, we know quite a lot. Um, in fact, as I mentioned about this the cigarette smoking link. Science knows. In fact, over the last 10 years, there's more. It's not even anecdotal evidence. It's it's scientific evidence out of many, many organizations within the world talking about the potential concerns of an emission such as a low level or a signal from a cell phone. Um, so, yeah. And, and if I could interrupt you real quick, uh, yeah. one, one resource that I found to be very helpful with regards to this, um, is uh, is the Environmental Health Trust website. Have you been to this website? Uh, at oh, yeah. E- EH yeah, yeah, Trust? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's, th- th- that's Deborah Davis. She uh-huh. does a great job of uh, communicating the problem. And she's one of the advocates, actually. Uh, her and uh, Carpenter, uh, Blake, there are a number of very uh, well-known scientists of uh, the best ilk trying to share with us the concerns. Yeah. But you and, remember, and, like and, you and when I and, and by the way, to, to, to interrupt you just real quick, when I have someone who I'm trying to convince about the, the dangers of cell phone radiation or why it's an issue, I send them to this site because it, it, it's very easy to just subscribe to the blog. And I mean, like just today, for example, they they have posted a major U.S. government study that found increased brain cancer in rats with exposure to uh, smartphone radiation. I believe this was the RF frequency that you were talking about. And then also uh, a, a pretty big article about a new recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics to reduce exposure to cell phones in kids, you know, who are playing whatever, you know, angry birds with the with the cell phone in their lap. So, yeah, this this ehtrust.org website for any of you listening in, uh, if you go to. Uh, this particular podcast show notes uh, over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash defend. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash defend. I'll link to everything that Daniel and I talk about, uh, including that website. Um, but Daniel, I interrupted you. What, what were you okay, saying? That, that's a great site. She's, Deborah has been, for the last uh, five years, very, very uh, high profile in this space, uh, trying to met, bring those messages across. Uh, But in 2011, or you may know, I'm not, I'm not sure, the World Health Organization issued a a research finding and said that uh, RF signals in the range we were talking about, 900 megahertz to to 10 gigahertz, they are a classified probable human carcinogen to be carcinogen. And, And so already... In 2011, it, people were beginning more and more concerned about it. And by the way, that's like um, the same category as arsenic is. Mm-hmm. So to give you a correlation, if, if, if you think car, uh, killing a rat is, is a way to, d- to die, then, uh, then you want to consider their view, too. But another even more up-to-date modern understanding is really being driven by the Bayer Initiative reports every year. They update their findings that are literally world findings about the impacts to the mobile phones, young children, parents, pregnant women, all these things the Bioinitiative reports deal with every year. So I would strongly encourage your listeners to seek out the Bioinitiative report. Is that is that uh, the Bioinitiative.org website? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's another really 
Really that good is one. Way to go. And yeah. and what I love about those guys is they are all scientific. There's a lady who who does Sydney Sage. You asked me something about a low level emissions at the extremely low end, if it's dangerous or not. Uh, Cindy Sage is uh, the editor for that uh, report. And oh, 15, 20 years ago, she wrote a report that said that 10 milligauss, which is very little emissions at the low end, can uh, triple, double to triple uh, a miscarriage of a pregnant woman. Um, so we know that there is a lot of information out there. They've been pushing that kind of information. It's all scientifically based. And uh, and they're the ones who are sort of the beacons in the space. One final thing. You did mention the uh, National Toxicity Program. That, mm-hmm. I think, is the science group behind that. Um, I, I hate to get into detail, but one of the controversies of, of the standard is, um, remember we talked about the microwave oven and, and it cooks your meat? Right. Um, well, that's called a, a thermal a thermal impact of a, a so a RF signal at 2.4 gigahertz has a thermal impact. It's well known in science and has been for many, many years. In fact, the standard talks only about the thermal impact. They, when the standard was set up 30 some odd years ago, the, 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 the standard was a six, six foot male, occasionally using a cell phone. And what they concluded is if it was m- uh, more than uh, an energy level of uh, uh, 1.6 watts, just just a simple number. If it's more than that, the the temperature around the ear or wherever you have it will will increase by two degrees. They only worried about the thermal impact. They never worried about the biological impact. Okay. So if you look at the uh, national uh, national uh, toxi- tox- toxicology program report, and by the way, that's a division of the. Uh, a, a national um, uh, health organization. Uh, they're, they're the federal government. They spent $25,000 million on setting up a clean environment. And it was an epidemiology study in which they looked at the impact of an RF signal around uh, 1.9 gigahertz um, at, uh, using CDMA and TDMA, two different technologies that are currently being used by cell phones. They what, have what are they called? They, CDMA and what? Uh, uh, CDMA and TDMA, they're, they're coding applications, okay. uh, uh, code division multiplexing, uh, time division multiplexing. It's, it's the way they transmit the signals and how they're received. And so what they did was they set up an environment and a thermal impact is when you're really, really close to the signal. And when they said two degrees, they talked about that two degrees as it related to being close to your head when you're using it. Well, mm-hmm. these the science experts were really bright. They moved the signal away to the point where the only result was not a thermal increase, but a biological impact. And so they took um, a peer-reviewed uh, report issued actually in the mid middle of the summer this year, and they had a sig- statistically significant database of 2,500, 3,000 participants in it, rats that, that were exposed to these emissions, and the results were unequivocal. There is a direct link between the, lo- the front lobe of the brain yeah. and to the heart, believe it or not. They were surprised that they found a, a sort of a rare um, a, a cancer uh, being a, a generated uh, by, uh, by emissions um, these types. So where before? Wait, wait. When you say it was affecting the heart, you mean like it, it, like the heat, the thermal effect of the phone was affecting the frontal lobe of the brain. No, that was it was the biological. That's what was important. The, or, or not the thermal effect, the biological effect. Right. They really looked at what's the impact of a, a ongoing low level emission touching the human body. So you mean even if there's no measurable temperature change in the human body from the heat produced by a device, you're talking about the actual microwave exposure causing biological issues that go above and beyond just the heat? That's exactly right, Ben. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that was so in- interesting about this. And, and it was statistically sound. So now the federal government, a branch of the federal government, has said that this stuff has a direct link to very serious health concerns. Yeah. 
And where before this was a debate, uh, ongoing debate in, in all the industries that, that play a part in it, this was a clear and evident uh, linkage between the, uh, this use of a cell phone and the potential impact to the body's cell. Have you seen some of the research on genetic mutations and cell damage, like DNA structural breaks and oh, fragmentation yeah. stuff like that? Yeah, well, I, I t- Ben, one of the things I, I was in the labs, um, I haven't talked about my uh, background, but I was in the labs and I would look at the, the data and I try to determine um, the, the accuracy of findings. And um, where before uh, there's been this debate, and here's the debate. The only way you would be happy that I can prove this to you that I'm plus or minus 5% confident of the data I give you is if I took, well, I don't know, 10,000 children, I put them in a room, radiated them, and watched to see what happens over a 20-year period and see who died and how they died. And obviously, I'm not going to do that then, right? Because we're not going to do that to our children. So there's a lack of this definitive, statistically significant data uh, simply because of the nature of the technology we talk about. Here's the first findings that come out that are statistically significant that identify with a confidence level that what we found is is likely there. Yeah, that's that's what's important about that finding. Yeah. And, and again, like, like, I don't want this whole podcast to just be scaremongering, but I mean, if you go to like this, this EH trust website, you find not only those, those DNA issues, but things like oxidative stress, right? Which, which I've talked about on this podcast before is probably one of the primary uh, causes of mitochondrial damage and eventually cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Um, there, there's some really interesting studies. Uh, have you seen the ones on sleep, like like the disruption of the ability to get into deep non-REM sleep? Oh, yeah. It, it mucks around with your uh, melatonin. Right, uh, exactly. That's why you should never, ever sit near uh, any um, transmitting uh, uh, technology. Even clocks transmit. As I said before, there's a byproduct of them operating. A cell phone, certainly not, because it, it screws around with your... Uh, uh, ADHD is considered, um, there are d- many studies that talk about the impact of children exposed to these emissions. Um, in fact, there was a, a guy from um, from uh, UK, uh, 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 Bernie Tower. Yeah. He's a, a, a British physicist. Uh, and he was working for, oh, I don't know, 30 40 years in the in their military and his his expertise as a physicist was to build weapons rf weapons that's what he did for the government so over the last i don't know um uh, 10 years or so uh bernie's retired and uh, bernie t-r-o-w-e-r retired yeah and he's been going to classrooms uh, 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 parents uh, that that are of children in classrooms and trying to identify the fact that the RF your children are exposed to the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5.0 gigahertz of a Wi-Fi signal in a classroom was the kind of weaponry I used to fight enemy. That's how um, he. Um, the messages he was pushing. That's crazy. So, that, know, that's why, like, like I have, for example, like something I travel with and keep in my house is I've got one of the, I, I use a MacBook, so I've got a little FireWire Ethernet converter, and yeah. I almost constantly have the Wi-Fi turned off, right? The the airport turned off on not just my phone, but also on my computer, and I hardwire in. Like, I take this thing to hotels, and when I check into a hotel, I ask them, do you have an Ethernet cable that I can use? Because most of them do. And most hotel rooms, if you have like an adapter, you can just plug straight into the Ethernet cable on your computer, for example, so that you don't have to get exposed to the Wi-Fi that you were just talking about. Because, I mean, the the the, the data on that alone, you know, cell phones aside, is flabbergasting when it comes to the, the amount of issues, health issues from exposure to Wi-Fi, constant exposure to Wi-Fi. The other thing that I do when I go into the hotel room, for example, is I find the, the Wi-Fi router and unplug it right away so that I can only be hardwired into the wall. 
Yeah, Ben, that's uh, you're you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, let me give you a, a technical uh, content message. Um, um, a cell phone generates 1.6 maximum 1.6 watts per kilogram. Um, if you were to go into a classroom where there's Wi-Fi, what is the what is the level of energy that's in that room? It's 0.5 watts, which is a substantially high low energy level uh, emissions that are in, in, in enveloping the children for eight hours a day. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, you, you said something that was very important. Um, we don't want to monger, uh, be warmongers about, about this subject matter. And, the, and there's a real reason you shouldn't worry about it, because there are simple things you can do, Ben, to reduce exposures. When you're in these kinds of environments um, in your home, for example, you're a great example of what to do to reduce emissions that you're exposed to. And it's simple stuff you do. And all you're doing really is reducing the impact to yourselves from the constant um, uh, attack from these emissions around you. Simple things. When yeah. you use a cell phone, do you know that when you take a cell phone one foot away from your head, 80% of the danger is gone? Yeah, that's what I've heard. Basically, the distance uh, from which you are, or the, the distance you are from a signal, uh, the, the radiation from that signal exponentially decreases the, the farther that you get from it, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. By four foot, it's 98% almost. Okay, so d- does that mean that, for example, the use of a, the use of a headset would be advantageous over hold, having the phone up to your, up to your, to your ear, obviously? Yeah, um, th- there's sort of degrees of, va- uh, of- uh, if you think about a cell phone, um, if you have it directly against your head, you're being exposed to the power levels maximum of 1.6 watts. If you were to put that and put earbuds on or, or overhead um, um, earmuffs, um, that would reduce that by 80%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and the other important thing to note with regards to that is that Bluetooth uses the same microwave frequency as a microwave oven as well. And I think Bluetooth is around that, that 2.4 gigahertz or so signal. And so people who hear you're not supposed to hold your cell phone up to your ear, but then get a Bluetooth headset, you're still getting microwave frequencies right next to your brain when you're using a Bluetooth headset, right? Oh uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a, Ben, that's a very good point. And you know, I typically interject at this point to try to give a perspective of what that means. Um, a cell phone can go up about five miles. And so it has enough power, enough energy to go from your, your cell phone to, to a tower that's almost five feet, five miles away. Uh, Wi-Fi has enough power to go several hundred feet. So there's much less power typically being transmitted out of that device. Bluetooth can go about 30 feet. The types of technology we talk about, portable devices, um, the class, uh, the class two um, uh, Bluetooth, it, it, it runs about thirty feet. So, is a Wi-Fi using a Wi-Fi connection better than a cell phone? Yeah, the power is much less. Uh, but is it good? Not necessarily. Bluetooth is better because it's much less. Right. Um, and then is the Bluetooth a problem? Yeah, there's still a low level of emissions, and. Um, is a wired um, um, pair of earbuds better? Yes, uh, that's even better because there's less energy being transmitted. Yeah. Please don't be upset with me because I'm interrupting this podcast to tell you about dark chocolate. That's right dark chocolate. So there is this website where you can get dark chocolate covered espresso beans, dark chocolate turbinado sea salt almonds, dark chocolate covered peanuts and cashews and cherries, and even dark chocolate coconut haystacks and dark chocolate orange peel strips. This website is, get ready to write this down, nuts.com. 
That's nuts.com. When you go to nuts.com, you can you can get more than just chocolate. If you're not a chocolate person, first of all, what's wrong with you? Second of all, you can get dried fruits. You can get nuts. You can get almond flour, chia seeds, spices, grains, any powders you want to throw in your smoothie, you name it. And nuts.com delivers this stuff straight to your door at a slamming deal. Not only that, but when you order from them now, you get four free samples. That means you get to choose from over 50 options. That's a $15 value when you go to nuts.com dot com slash fitness. That's nuts.com slash fitness to get as many dark chocolate pieces or apricots or figs or dates or strawberries or anything else you want, even gummy bears. Not that I endorse heavy consumption of gummy bears, but nuts.com slash fitness if you did want to do that and you get free samples along with your order. So check them out. This podcast is also brought to you by something that's sitting right upstairs in my guest bedroom of my home right now. And that's one of the most comfortable mattresses on the face of the planet. This is a mattress that has a combination of really nice springy latex, but also supportive memory foam. So you get this little combination of sink and bounce. I really don't know what sink and bounce mean when it comes to a mattress, but I'm guessing sink is how your body sinks into the mattress and bounce is how much fun it is to bounce up and down on it when you're having your next pillow fight party. But either way, uh, adaptable pillows, soft, breathable sheets, they've got it all and they deliver it straight to your home. They cut out the middleman so you get a slamming deal on a mattress. Here is what you do. You go to Casper's website. It's Casper Mattresses. You go to casper.com slash Ben and you use promo code Ben. And when you do, you get $50 off any mattress purchase that you get to try for 100 nights risk-free in your home. If you don't like it, they'll pick it up. They'll refund you everything free shipping, free returns to U.S. and Canada. So that's casper.com slash Ben and use promo code Ben. So, so when it comes to, for example, keeping your cell phone away from your head, one thing that I do is I use a special kind of headset called a, an air tube headset. Have you seen these? I, ha- I have been. That is the best uh, to use. And can you uh, can are, you explain to people, since, since I know you're the expert in this, you could probably do a better job explaining it than I can, how does sound actually arrive at your ear when you're using an air tube headset? It's acoustical. Um, when, when, uh, we, when you have a speaker in a room and you're listening to the music, uh, that, that sound wave is interacting with the uh, sp- airspace. And all of a sudden it comes to your ear and you can hear. Well, that's what happens literally with air tubes. They, they take it, they convert the, uh, the, um, the audio into a speaker. And then they take that speaker and they put it through a tube. And at the other end, you can hear it. And there's no electrical signal being transmitted through that, that uh, tube. So you have the benefit of hearing the the, um, the 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 uh, the video voice uh, or music wherever it may be and um you have the benefit of no emissions passing closely to your head while you're using them yeah i like it now now a couple other questions before we talk more about ways that we can protect ourselves from these type of things um first of all i know that you worked or at least were were involved with companies like telecordia and AT&T and bell labs Do you know anything about like internal discussions that are going on in the cell phone industry to try and mitigate some of these issues? And one of the reasons I ask that is like, you know, for example, um, I know that Apple just produced the iPhone 7 that doesn't even have a headset jack. So like that air tube headset that we talked about, I think you have to have some kind of special adapter to even be able to use. And that's how they made the phone waterproof. But I'm curious, like, like, is there, is there discussion inside these agencies that you're aware of in which people are trying to figure out ways to mitigate the damage rather than just make these devices more convenient to use and, or more powerful? Um, I'm not aware of it, but I'll, and I'll tell you a story. Um, I, I, when I ran tech, uh, t- the technical labs and the various uh, companies, they were all, by, by the way, uh, all generated from divestiture. Uh, 1984, the Bell system had to break up. So the laboratory experts that I had in the uh, Bell labs went to Telcordia, and then um, that's where most of the uh, standards and testing was done uh, for the Bell system. 
And at that time, I used to have experts that I would make sure tested the right stuff. Um, my concern was always the environment it worked in um, and and how to prevent it from harming others and how effective it was in doing the function it had to do. And that's why I get when people talk to me about grounding, for example, I used to have sophisticated grounding testing, not for protecting people, but protecting the electronics. Hmm. We didn't even believe at that time there was a concern. Yet at that time, um, we had the mainframes uh, that were taking the power supplies and these major conversion power supplies and everything else that became part of the technology that evolved there. And they were all emitting uh, emissions that, that were dangerous to the users. Hmm. So we just didn't have a sense at that time that that was something we needed to focus on. Um, for me, that changed, actually. Uh, being very familiar with the space, um, when I well, left those spaces and uh, did other, uh, had other interests, I, I, I began realizing that uh, the industry um, didn't quite fully understand what the technology was all about. And there was things that there were really to, very dangerous. And being close to your body, having these signals close to your body, was clearly a, a, of a concern. In fact, that's what prompted me to provide, uh, to develop technologies that help uh, people deal with these things. Now, I've got one of the one of the pieces of technology that you helped to develop this this thing called the Defender Shield, which is like this this case that the phone goes inside of. And the thing that baffles me and that that actually it makes me raise my eyebrow about all these devices that say they're going to protect you against cell phone radiation. Like when I have my phone in this, obviously it's 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 shielding some of the heat from getting onto my body. Like if I have it in my pocket, the phone feels less hot, et cetera. But. How is it even working if I can still take calls and I can still make calls when I've got this case on the phone? I mean, wouldn't it necessarily indicate that if it were protecting you from radiation, you wouldn't be able to make or receive calls? One may be coming to that conclusion, but let me give you a little bit of additional detail that may help. Um, a RF signal, uh, the Bluetooth, the Wi-Fi, the cellular connection, there what's referred to as omnidirectional. What, what that means is it goes and starts at a tiny pinpoint and opens up and opens up like a ball, keeps on getting bigger and bigger. So the whole room fills with that RF transmitter. Um, and so what do we do to, uh, to uh, deal with that omnidirectional signal? What we do is we simply create a wall, a wall that says you are a signal can't go through here. Okay. But if you want to go the other way, be my guest. And it lets you go in the direction of the cell towers or the Wi-Fi. It works fine and doesn't interfere with the signal at all. But that part of the RF signal uh, that is towards your body, we shield with a uh, with a wall. Simple as that. Okay, so basically, when I when I put my phone inside this case, this Defender Shield case, it allows the RF frequency to not penetrate into my body, but at the same time, it allows the phone to send out a signal to the tower itself. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and he, and the way that it's doing that is because the part of the the of it that's facing my body is that like a stronger shield, and the part that's facing outward yeah. isn't. Yeah, that's okay. right. All right, it has got a it. wall, the other side doesn't have it. So if you, if you owned a case like this, you would want to make sure that you didn't like put it in your pocket with the wrong side facing in? <laughs> That's right. That's I didn't exactly know that. Right. Okay. Yeah, you, you definitely want to put it in the, where, the, where, the, where the wall is, is facing your body. What's it made out of? What is this case made out of? You know, it's funny. Uh, good, good, good question. When I was in the labs, and I hate to say it was early 80s, actually before that, um, we there was a transatlantic um, cabling uh, put in, and one of the problems that was uh, we were encountering encountering when we were going over there was that the byproduct of a current flow, which we talked about before, was an emission, electromagnetic radiation, 
at the 300 hertz and below, and the fish were attacking the 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 uh, the cables. So we actually at that time invented um, a material. It was a composite of many uh, materials that uh, that combined actually refracts the 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 uh, emission and keeps it contained in this lost in the material. So what we have is in our wall a um, we refract the stuff that's 300 hertz and below, and we conduct and absorb the RF that's above. So it's a simple it's a simple concept. Um, we don't get too complicated about it. It's a, it's a serious engineering problem, but uh, from a, a practical design point of view, it's fairly straightforward. Okay, so the shielding is just made up of a bunch of layers of, yeah. of products that absorb the EMFs. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Okay. Got it. As well as the heat. Yes. Okay. Hey, Ben, I want, let's go back to the, what happens to a cell. Sure. That's always a good story. I, As a mechanical engineer, you look for the mechanics of what happens uh, to, a, to a cell. And we have spent a lot of time trying to understand these kinds of things. And some of the conclusion I've found in the medical community is, is inspiring. Um, when, when you talked about the oxidative stress of the cell, uh, oxidative stress actually creates a thin, a thin film uh, uh, around the cell. It becomes weakened. Um, as a result of that, as you may know, um, the proteins that pass back and forth um, are, re- are retarded, uh, sometimes not non-existent between the uh, adjacent cells. And so all of a sudden, you have a situation in which you're not feeling well today or in something not quite right or you're getting right. headaches. And that's because the cell itself is saying, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of that exposure. Do you know something like um, 15 to 20 percent? of everyone that is exposed to these RF emissions and the extremely low stuff, they're electrically hypersensitive. And what they're actually feeling is the stress of the cells dealing with um, the the exposure. What I like um, more recently, uh, there's been actually seven, uh, several different uh, experts in this space looking for the mechanics. You have um, your calcium flow into the cell which is then creating a nitrate buildout in this within the cell. That's right. what's causing the DNA damage. That's what's causing the mutated cells that you just talked about. We are now understanding the actual mechanics of what's happening to a cell when it comes to what happens under a uh, exposure environment like that. So I'm, I'm excited about those kinds of uh, research that we're doing. We're better understanding why our bodies are reacting the way they are to these things. Just playing devil's advocate, like, you know, oxidative stress is something that's considered to be like a hormetic stressor, right? So when it's when yep. you get uh, the production of peroxides and free radicals in small amounts, your body will, for example, step up its own endogenous antioxidant production, you know, and, right. and, and small amounts of, of UVA and UVB radiation are good for you. You know, you talked about grounding and earthing earlier. And, you know, we know that that, for example, the planet itself emits like a mild uh, like a, like a pulsed electromagnetic frequency when you're when you're standing on it, it gets absorbed into your body. Uh, could by the you, way, by the way, Ben, that's an extremely low frequency, uh, below ten. Hertz. Yeah, yeah, it's like seven point three eight hertz, yeah, or right. seven point eight three hertz, or something like that. But um, when it comes to, to cell phones, could you argue that like minimal use, like occasionally getting exposed to the to the to the radio frequencies and the creation of this oxidative stress? might be something that in small amounts isn't necessarily harmful and might actually be even be beneficial. Have they ever done studies, I guess, that shows like a dose response effect? No, actually, that's one of the things that I I would like to see. Uh, a lot of, like, for example, with, um, with the uh, National uh, Tox- Toxicology Program report, um, they didn't say if we moved it an inch away, this is the effect that would happen. If we reduce the energy level by X, that's what we saw happen. So there's not a lot, a lot of granularity in what we understand these days yet. And so uh, we created rules of thumb. Um, if you're going to be in front of an RF signal for really, really a short period of time, and it's a um, reasonably strength mater- uh, uh, emission, um, and you're not going to be doing it long, then don't worry about it. It's not going to bother you. 
what we know is the longer you're exposed in the three hours or more space, we know that's when it's more likely true that there's oxidative stress. Okay. There's, there's an impact to the body. So it, it's duration, how long are you there? Um, and, um, uh, and you got to watch that as you increase it, it gets worse. Okay. Got it. So you've, you've got this case that the phone goes into this, this defender shield case. It's basically the best way I can describe it. And if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash defend, I'll, I'll put a link and some photos of what this thing actually looks like, uh, along with the discount code, uh, that you can use to, to get a, a 15% discount on, on this actual case. Um, it, it's like a flip open case that flips up or, or, you know, as I told you guys, I think the last time I saw you at a conference, Daniel, I was showing you how hard it was for me to Snapchat yes. with, the, with yes. the flip, but you guys have a different case that'll, that allows for us social media right. mavens to, to be able to right. Snapchat away. Um, so, so this case opens and closes over the phone. It goes into the phone. How is this any different though than, you know, there's so many devices out there. There, there's the, oh. like these little dots that you put on your phone there's like the um, one I've talked about before is like the Pong case that that supposedly blocks EMF. Like, like what's the difference between this and any of these other devices out there that supposedly block EMF? Uh, great question, Ben. Um, I, I always like to help um, sort that through, especially the, um, the especially the holographic stickers. By the way, <laughs> those those are the ones that, that always get me. It, it, it's very simple, uh, Ben. When uh, working in in the laboratory, the only thing you consider real is something that can be measured. Measured knowing what you have with measurements that you know is real. Um, so when you look for any device that talks about its place in the world in the RF spaces shielding, you always wanna make sure that there's evidence, independent evidence that it works. Now, let me get back to to Pong. Pong and others, um, they use a different technique for what they refer to as shielding. It's not, remember we talked about the omnidirectional link? Um, mm -hmm. It connects, it's omnidirectional. Um, a cell phone can create three different levels of strength. And what those three levels are is, hey, I'm really close. I don't need to output a lot of power. And then uh, you walk away from the tower, you're two miles away. Oh, I need more power. Let me go to the medium level. And then there's the, I'm five miles away. I can barely see the tower. I'm going to be at the maximum strength. What Pong and others do is they actually take that signal and they build an antenna, a bridge between the cell phone and the tower, they help that signal find a path to the tower easier than it typically would be, thus making it appear it's less distance, it has less power needed to be generated. So in the case of, um, of Pong types of technology, they're reducing the power levels of the cell phone itself because they're helping increase the connection uh, efficiency between the cell phone and there. So they actually do, they're an engineering product that do what they say they do. Hmm. Uh, they don't eliminate the signal. We eliminate it, but uh, their technology is better. It's like we were talking before about uh, earbuds uh, versus uh, putting a, a, to your side uh, versus other ways of dealing with emissions. Reducing the power level is one of those things that's a good thing. Even those holographic stickers? No, 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 no. They, they're in a, in, in my opinion, they're in a different class. Uh, they, at most, they talk about an indirect um, result. There is no such thing as an indirect result when it comes to scientific study. Um, they can claim that if we use this and the muscle changes in this way, Therefore, something happened and you're safe. That is illogical. It's not a, an engineer-based uh, evaluation. Uh, with those kinds of things, they're using technologies that, quite honestly, I'm baffled with because it's not scientific physics they're talking about. Um, so for me, some of this stuff just doesn't seem to make any sense. 
And it's very simple. Where's your independent laboratory study work that shows this is to be as legitimate as it says it is? Got it. And they'll have difficulty finding it. Okay. So you guys have done actual FCC certified lab testing, like independent oh, yeah. testing on, on this case. Oh, yeah. You, anybody uh, that you buy from, you should look for independent study work that 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 identifies the claims as being accurate or not. Okay, now now this would obviously fix my cell phone issue if I put this around my cell phone and then ideally when I'm making and receiving calls, not only would I have it inside this case, but I'd be using like an air tube headset, right? Yeah, you okay. could actually put your cell phone in your pocket with the air tube. It, it's the ideal world for you. Okay, cool. Um, and, and by the way, you can get these air tube headsets like off of. Uh, well, I know you can get them on Amazon. Do you guys have them on your website? Daniel, uh, they're actually going up this week, believe it or not. OK, cool. So so if people use that 15 percent discount, then they could they could get the discount on both the AirTube headset and also the case. Yes. OK, cool. Now, what about laptops? Um, because obviously, you know, not only if you don't have the airport wireless turned off, are they emitting a Wi-Fi signal? Um, do they produce an RF signal as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, really? This is an important point I think you're, you're uh, talking about. A tablet looks so small. Remember, generates a Wi-Fi signal as strong as your laptop. There's no difference. They they go to the maximum power levels to connect to the routers. So you have the Wi-Fi signal, 2.4, uh, 5.0 gigahertz, transmitting from uh, laptops uh, you have the Bluetooth, typically, um, the, um, you have the ELF, by the way. That's also there as well. A, a great story, Ben. Um, when I got involved with this stuff uh, several years ago, um, with, uh, we were on, it was a holiday season, this time of year. Um, my, my sons were visiting, and they were, they're, they're crazy like you having their cell laptops on their lap all the time, you know, working away. And and your generation is always using these technologies for long durations of time. So uh, my wife says to my kids, um, you know, there's got to be something wrong. I want grandchildren. Um, can't you do something about not putting it on your lap so long? And that's when I thought, wait a minute, I know exactly what the problems were. Let me go find a solution. I, I couldn't find it. In fact, I thought a lot of misinformation in the marketplace. So that's why I created and designed the technologies I, we use to protect my sons. Mm. After about yeah. three to four hours a, a cell phone, a laptop use, 25% of the male sperm count is immobile. Oh, yeah. Like my, uh, not to be crass, but like my boss hurt when i when i work on a laptop without because i have one of these these uh devices these it, it's basically like a tablet that your laptop sits on top of that i just throw in my book bag and take with me everywhere but it blocks the heat and the radiation and i can put my laptop in my lap because i used to just use like a pillow you know for example but this thing blocks more than the pillow and and again like my don't hurt after i've been on my computer for like you know 30 45 minutes you don't feel your thighs getting really hot you don't feel a little bit of like sweat on your inner thighs that you get when you're working on the laptop so having not just your phone inside a case but also having your laptop on top of some kind of a a pad i think is also crucially important like if i mean why shield yourself from your cell phone radiation and then you know get yourself radiated by your laptop at the same time uh, that's right uh, uh, ben uh, you know pillow does nothing a concrete wall does nothing. A, 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 a piece of wood doesn't prevent a signal from passing through. So when you're feeling your um, walls heat up, that's the thermal impact of that signal close to your body. Right. That's exactly what it is. It's not just the heat coming off of the, with the fan. And those things can be dangerous. In fact, we we mentioned something about um, men, but probably 10 years ago, there was a study, 10,000 10, subjects out of Italy, um, women that were exposed to um, emissions. Uh, they had uh, something like 2% were, uh, had uh, tumors, non-cancerous tumors, by the way, most of them. 
But there was certainly not only a male problem, but a, a female problem as well. Oh, yeah. When I look at the evidence of like single and double stranded DNA breaks and reproductive dysfunction, you know, I, I also get concerned about what this does long term, not only to my future kids, but like their kids kids. When we're talking about like disrupting eggs, damaging sperm, damaging DNA, you're talking about affecting kids that maybe you haven't even had given birth to yet. So it's it's pretty crazy. I know they've also found a, a lot of effects from microwaves and stem cells, so which are very active in kids. And, you know, when, when you're talking about like decreasing the effectiveness of stem cells, which are crucial for growth, for regulation of, of uh, you know, repair in the body, it's a pretty significant biological impact. Now, ben, uh, uh, let me add to that. Um, some experts, uh, I'm not sure I know enough about it to know, but some experts say that the catastrophe is still to come. And it's yeah. because of the reason you just said subtending generations of damaged DNA, mutated cells, become uh, impact the, the, the creation of unknown problems in the future of our subtending generations. Right. That goes way and, above and beyond just them wandering the streets playing yeah. Pokemon Go. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, so so your website is uh, DefenderShield.com, uh, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. I know the code... Uh, fifteen percent discount is Ben if you use that on on the Defender Shield products. I'm also going to put a link in the show notes. Those of you interested, I'll put a link to Bio Initiative and also the Environmental Health Trust website. If you have friends who are just like scoffing at you for having your your fancy phone case or your laptop tablet, and you want them to see the research, send them to those sites. So if you go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com/defend, that's BenGreenfieldFitness.com/defend. I'll link to all of this in the show notes. And of course, when you're over there, if you have, if you have comments, you have questions for Daniel or questions for me, um, leave them over there. Um, I know that Daniel, like you mentioned on his site, he's got the air tube headsets. He's got the little cases like I use that you can put the smartphone inside of. And then he's got the, the, um, the pads that you put underneath the laptop. And these are the ones that they're, they're made from the same material, like the multi-layering shielding material that the, that the case is made from. Right, Daniel? Yeah, exactly. When okay. I, it's not magic. We use the same proven technology uh, on all of our products, so we have the same level of performance. Yeah, so you're blocking the EMF that you talked about, but then also the ELF, the radio right. frequency, the RF, and then also the heat. So you want to block all all four of those. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay, cool. Well, um, again, the website that you can check out or the show notes for this podcast, it's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash defend i'd love to hear your questions your comments for either daniel or myself and um daniel thanks for coming on the show today and sharing this stuff with us uh no problem at all i appreciate you inviting us uh, ben i really do all right folks so that's how to defend yourself against cell phone radiation and keep your laptop from frying your your body and, and your balls or your eggs or your your ovaries whatever whatever we want to call them whether you're a man or a woman um and uh, again, bengreenfieldfitness.com slash defend. Daniel, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 